Accordingly, in 1860, the value assigned to enslaved black people totaled over three billion dollars. Three billion. In 1861, the value placed on cotton produced by enslaved black people was 250 million. And the United States is yet to compensate descendants of enslaved black people for that labor. It's also important to note that that three billion dollars at the time in 1860 was more than the railroads um, and the factories combined. So that just shows us what slave labor meant to the American economy. Hey, what's up, YouTube community? Thanks so much for tuning into this video. I'm giving a lecture before the Supreme Court of the state of Minnesota on the legal implications of reparations. Look, there's so many golden nuggets in this video. You definitely want to watch the entire thing. So look, I need for you to do a few things. I need for you to subscribe. I need for you to like the video. I need for you to share it. And then I also need for you to comment below about what you think about the video. Pose any questions you still have. I'll make future videos and ensure that I address it directly to you. So look, as always, sociologist Ray, aiming to speak truth to power, and I hope that this conversation sparks uh, At the uh, University of Maryland, and he's a senior fellow at the Brookings Institute. Dr. Ray's research and work speaks to ways that inequity may be attenuated through racial uplift, activism, and social policy. He previously presented to the Hennepin County bench, and we're just so grateful, Dr. Ray, that you could come today and present to our uh, Committee for Equality and Justice. Thanks so much for giving us your time. And a big Minnesota welcome to you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Can you all hear me okay? All right, great. Thank you so much, Judge. It's, it's great to be uh, with some of the people who I interacted with previously. I look forward to interacting with you all as well. So... Obviously, we're talking about the legal implications of reparations for black Americans. Um, again, Rayshawn Ram, a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution and a professor of sociology at the University of Maryland. I've done extensive work on this topic, including, uh, as you see in the center with my colleague, uh, Dr. Andre Perry, where we laid out an agenda for reparations for black Americans and, and why we need it and then what it might actually look like. And then some of these other pieces have rounded out the discussion in terms of thinking about different strategies for dealing with it that I'll be presenting, whether that be thinking about uh, how we fund reparations at the federal level, which I think federal land is a way to start, uh, start that conversation. And then even in Evanston, uh, I guess technically not too far from you all geographically at least, in terms of what they're doing, where they recently just rolled out uh, their first payees from uh, their reparations program. And I'll be talking more about that as well. I think it becomes important to center us in this discussion and to center it with uh, Dr. King, who said, we have come to our nation's capital to cash a check. When the architects of our republic wrote the magnificent words of the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, they were signing a promissory note to which every American was to fall heir. It is obvious today that America has defaulted on this promissory note insofar as her citizens of color are concerned. Instead of honoring this sacred obligation, America has given the Negro people a bad check, a check which has come back marked insufficient funds, but we refuse to believe that the Bank of Justice is bankrupt. MLK actually made this statement at the March on Washington. A lot of people seem to miss that part. We focus on certain parts of that speech and not the entire part of the speech. Now, this is one of the things that I said in a testimony before uh, the state of Maryland on reparations. Given the lingering legacy of slavery on the racial wealth gap, the monetary value we, now, we, we know that was placed on enslaved black people, the fact that other groups have received reparations and the fact that black populations were originally awarded reparations only to have them rescinded provide overwhelming evidence that reparations for the descendants of enslaved black people are in order. So part of this is thinking about why reparations are necessary. Well, let's go back to 1860. And we know that just this 4th of July that just passed, the same length of time that the United States has been the United States of America um, was the same length of time that black people were enslaved. We have to think about that juxtaposition in our American history. We can't detach the two of them. Accordingly, in 1860, the value assigned to enslaved black people totaled over $3 billion. $3 billion. 
1861, the value placed on cotton produced by enslaved black people was 250 million. And the United States is yet to compensate descendants of enslaved black people for that labor. It's also important to note that that $3 billion at the time in 1860 was more than the railroads um, and the factories combined. So that just shows us what slave labor meant to the American economy. And we know now today that the average white family has roughly eight times the amount of wealth as the average black family. As we enter this recession and this level of inflation, it's going to probably go back to 10 times because that's typically what happens when the economy is hit hard, uh, black people get hit harder, and we see the racial gap continue to expand. The median and mean wealth of black families is less than 15% that of white families. And white high school dropouts have more wealth than black college graduates suggesting that education does little to close that gap, where we know that black college graduates have seven times less wealth than white college graduates. Neighborhoods that are at least 50% black have half the home values on average to neighborhoods with no black residents. Of course, we can look at black wealth here. We just use a snapshot from 2016 to 2019, really showing that little has changed. We could even look at it over the past three years. We would see something similar in terms of what's happening there. And of course, we know that slaves were part of what made America, America. Not only, of course, can we think about colonization and genocide, uh, whether that be in Africa or the New Americas, but also the fact that slaves were part of the, the, part of the production scheme. So you had manufacturing goods, raw materials, and slaves. As I mentioned, the slave trade that time period, 1619 through 1865, 8 million Africans died during transport. 20, 20 million are estimated to have died overall. So we can see the way this plays out. We can look at different states, particularly on the East Coast and the South, and see how many slaves were, were there in 1770. And this just gives us an idea of the prominence, particularly when we start getting in some of the Southern states and we started to see the very high percentage. But even in states like New York and Rhode Island, which for some reason people try to let the East Coast off the hook, we still see that at that time, it was a fairly high percentage of the state population. And accordingly, if we look in the state of New York, this, uh, if you've been to New York, you've been to Manhattan, uh, lower Manhattan, you know that there is an African burial ground located by federal buildings. When they started to uh, construct these federal buildings where the CIA and FBI and other federal buildings are located, they were noticing that the ground was really fertile. They were trying to figure out what was going on. They were trying to hit, you know, uh, essentially what they call virgin soil, soil that had not been touched by anything else. And they kept digging and they discovered bones. They discovered bodies. And it was estimated that roughly 20,000 bodies, African bodies were buried there as they were coming off of slave ships from Africa to New York um, and were literally dumped on sort of a mass grave site. Uh, we can also look at uh, the abolition of slavery and we can see how it grew over time in terms of thinking about uh, the, the, the number of abolitions of slavery and how quickly that took off in the early 1800s. And then of course we see at the time that slavery ended, but some of that continued. Why would that be? Well, in some states and lo localities, slavery was technically still legal in those places, even though it had been abolished federally. And then I think it's also important to chronicle the connection between enslavement and cotton production, which again, we know cotton production is one of the main ways that made America, America. And we could see that they coincided with one another because that labor had to be done. So we could see the way that the slave population coincided there. This is just an example of looking at uh, the slave population um, and the freed population. A lot of people like to say, oh, well, there were more, you know, freed black people. Well, not as much as we might think. It's always kind of hovered around that 13 percent, uh, which is kind of fascinating, I think, to think about, considering that 13 percent is pretty much the percentage that the black population has been overall in the United States since the time slavery ended. So slavery ends. And what happens? We have Reconstruction. Reconstruction was set to do three things. Reconstruction was set to figure out what to do with free slaves, how to integrate them, how to deal with southern states that had uh, aimed to move away from the Union, and how to integrate the Confederate leadership. One of the big things that came out of what to do with slaves was 40 acres and a mule, which you all have probably heard about. 
Well, one thing you might not know is that General Grant issued field order number 15. This was 40 acres and a mule to give uh, acres of land from former slave owners to formerly enslaved people. That did not happen. Um, and part of thinking about one of the reasons why it didn't happen is because after Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, a lot of things got reversed. Okay, then the Freedmen's Bureau was created. This was supposed to provide resources, education, job training, food, clothing to freed black people. Black people worked. They put their money in the Freedmen's Bureau. It was a bank of sorts as black people still weren't able to take it full advantage in certain places of access to, to economic resources. And the Freedmen's Bureau completely failed. So all that money that black people had invested in that failed at that mark. Then we go, um, of course, to a similar period of time with Rutherford B. Hayes, of course, taking over uh, after Abraham Lincoln and sort of bartering on black people and reconstruction ended early. Why is that significant? Because one of the biggest things he did that people miss is that he allowed the southern states to start back ruling themselves. So what happened at that point was, was that Union soldiers left southern states. This is part of the narrative about states' rights. This is where it really, really comes from. And so part of the states' rights meant that they could construct different ways to, to re-enslave black people, like through convict leasing, where in the state of Alabama, 75% of its state revenue came from convict leasing, roughly the same percentage that came from enslavement. So we can see the way this happened. So this is just laying it out that there were other groups that also received reparations in various ways. Not only was it that black people were promised the 40 acres and it didn't happen, but indigenous people received land and billions of dollars for various benefits and programs for being forcibly exiled from their native lands, um, like my like my my great grandmother, for example. And, and what's interesting here is that still enough hasn't been done. But the point is that there is a president here. We also know for Japanese Americans who were interned during World War Two, one point five billion dollars was allocated to those who were interned. That didn't happen until the late 1980s early 1990s. So when people start talking about too much time has went by, uh, we still have a lot of things that happen where a lot of time went by. But for some reason with black people, uh, these sort of things don't seem to occur. We also know that via the Marshall Plan that the United, Sta the United States worked and still does work to ensure that Jews receive reparations for the Holocaust, including making various investments over time. Um, in 1952, West Germany agreed to pay uh, three point for uh, five billion dollar Deutsche marks to Holocaust survivors. A lot of that fund continues to this day, but black people are the only group that is yet to receive it. I've essentially covered uh, how we think about the, the, the Homestead Act as well. Another part of this, of the Homestead Act though, is that millions of acres of land was allocated. Think about Wild Wild West movies. Wild Wild West movies, if you were like me growing up, it was one of the things that I watched. I watched Wild Wild West movies, In the Heat of the Night, Matlock, and more Wild Wild West movies. And I always thought that it was fascinating that uh, they would just go to a place and just kind of be able to just take over, just make up their own stuff. Well, that was because as the United States headed west and started to expand, they offered land for credit lines, essentially free credit lines that people could get. And whoever claimed it was able to receive it. Why is this important? Well, the Homestead Act was originally set up for black people to have 46 million acres of land in 160 acre blocks. But that never happened for black people. It was repealed uh, roughly a year after it had been instated. And this is the thing about black progress. It happens, then it reverses, kind of similar to what, what happened around police reform. I mean, nothing at the federal level truly happened um, after George Floyd and some of the others that we could also talk about. And this is part of what the Homestead Act looked like. Look at this. It lasted much longer than people think. The red is the land that people were conquering. And of course, we got to be realistic that this was once Mexico that was also uh, taken over. So we, we have to put these things in a particular context. So what is the current fallout from some of this? Well, let's just look at D.C. Some map of D.C. from some analysis I did with some of my colleagues, Dana Fisher and Don Dow. On the left, this is household income. The lighter the color, the more affluent. The darker the color, the less affluent. So more money, less money. This is where Brookings is. Brookings is, is over here, right? 
um, just to give you an idea of where we are uh, around DuPont Circle, whereas this is Northeast DC. This is uh, the racial composition of Washington DC. The darker the colors are where more black people live, the lighter colors are where, where more white people live. You can almost put these two maps on top of each other and they are almost identical, showing that race and class are intrinsically linked with one another. We cannot talk about one without talking about the other. Part of it, when it de deals with housing, we can go back decades and see that very little has changed. The darker color, more black people, lighter color, more white people, decades before this actually happened because of the way that redlining, residential segregation, um, and these and restricted covenants play a role. But we also know, because one of the narratives people say is, oh, well, you know, black people just go out and pull themselves up from their own bootstraps. Stop asking for handouts. Well, people in Tulsa, they did that with Black Wall Street. Black Wall Street was a thriving town, not just a black town, but just a town, one of the wealthiest places. And of course, we know that almost in an instant, 300 people were killed, 35 blocks destroyed, all of those businesses, banks, homes destroyed. People fled and their land was taken over. And it's not just Tulsa. There are other black Wall Streets as well. East St. Louis, where up to 200 were killed, 6,000 ended up being homeless, 300 businesses destroyed. We could go to Rosewood, Florida, 150 deaths. As you can see, that was in the paper, whites gathered for miles to slay Negroes. Last Negro homes raised in Rosewood, literally just wiping them out. And then of course, we can even go to Detroit. 34 killed, including 16 police officers, $28 million in damage, where uh, white people did not want black people to move in. So we see no matter what we're talking about, whenever black people have created these spaces, we continue to see how it plays out. And of course, there are other cities, even more recently, that we could highlight that have had, in many ways, race riots, particularly after the assassination uh, or around the assassination of King. And also we can think about the Kennedys from Rochester, New York to Watts, California, Chicago, Cleveland. I mentioned Detroit, Newark. The other thing we have to think about is even after slavery ended, you had lynchings that were occurring at a very high rate. And the unfortunate reality is that the rate at which black people are killed by police today is the rate at which black people were lynched over a century ago. That's roughly one every one to two days, about every 40 hours a black person is killed by police in the United States, um, in addition to the over 1,000 is killed by police every year. But lynchings coincided with that. And of course, what happened there is you had the Great Migration North, not just for more economic opportunities, but to avoid lynching. And this was the lynching trail. Uh, the darker the color suggests the more people were lynched and people were heading north. And this is just showing the South, but I mean, by, by no means uh, are the Midwest and East Coast let off the hook and even the West Coast where we not only saw black people being lynched, but also Latinos, Native Americans, and also some white people who were aiming to create racial equality. There have always been consequences for that. Um, we can just look at the number of people that were lynched by state. You can look at this and, and more or less see uh, per 100,000 residents, the rate to which this was occurring. I mean, very high in many regards. It was a fear that, uh, that black people had, and it was a very, very rational fear that they had. And it speaks to Billie Holiday's Strange Fruit, that song, if you've heard about it, where she talks about um, what happens when, uh, when you see bodies hanging from fruit. But interestingly, that song wasn't originally hers. It was a poem written by a Jewish man who had moved to the United States with his family. And some of his, some of his neighbors, some of his friends, his colleagues who happened to be white, they invited him out for a public event. And it was a lynching. And he was completely just flabbergasted by it. I mean, he was disgusted. And he went home and he essentially constructed this poem about what he saw, about how they were hanging these bodies from trees as if they were strange fruit. And that's where Billie Holiday got the song from. But it doesn't simply stop there. The United States also had another opportunity to make it right with the New Deal. One thing you all are probably familiar with the New Deal is that the New Deal came on the heels of the uh, economic collapse, the Great Depression. Part of what happened there, two programs were created. Um, not only was Social Security created, but also we had the GI Bill. Ira Katz Nelson, a historian, really highlights it. 
what he calls making of the middle class and really the making of the white middle class when affirmative action was right, white. That was President Roosevelt, one of my favorite presidents who uh, did not have a good moment here. Great moment for that scene for the country, but bartered on the backs of black people as normal, where when he signed this legislation, there were provisions to omit large segments of black people. So let's take the Social Security, for example. Social Security set minimum wages, established retirement, all sorts of things, uh, set work hours, the 40 hour work week became a thing then. And what happened is they excluded two primary occupations, domestic work and farm work. Well, why is that significant? Because over 60% of black people in the, uh, in the country and over 75% of black people in the South worked in those two occupations. Why is that? Because those are the two occupations they did during enslavement. And that's pretty much what black people knew the best and what they were relegated to. The other thing about the GI Bill, even though white and black soldiers were going to fight in World War II together, when they came back home, they were treated differently. The GI Bill really catapulted America into the middle class because eight out of 10 men born during the 1920s were drafted to go to war. This means in the 1950s and 1960s, they were in their 30s and 40s raising families and they were able to get money to go to college, get money to send their kids to go to college, uh, get money to put down on homes and also start up businesses. That money was mandated federally and distributed locally. This gets back to states' rights. And in states that had a larger percentage of black people, they said black people could not access this money in the same way. And you get these particular outcomes. This is the reason why Perry Mitchell who was the first black congressman to the South uh, in the South after Reconstruction or pretty much during uh, since the Jim Crow era, uh, ended up having to, to go somewhere else for college initially at Morgan State, uh, HBCU in Maryland, and then sued the University of Maryland to get in. He happened to get his master's degree, first African-American to get his master's degree at the University of Maryland while taking all of his courses on campus, happened to be my department where I'm a professor at, and now our building is named after him. But it these sort of legacies become some of the ways we think about it. And the legacy, particularly when it comes to residential discrimination, plays out in big ways. For example, in home appraisals, where you see on the left, of Bean and Alex Horton, uh, had, they had their home appraised, she was there. They were like, this can't be right. So they removed all signs. She lived there, their biracial son. Um, Alex was there for the next appraisal. It jumped 40%. You have on the right, Stephen Richmond in Hartford, Connecticut, he was like, something is it right? Ask his neighbor to stand in for him. He removed family photos, movie posters. And then all of a sudden, his white neighbor saw his neighbor's house, who was black, shoot through the sky simply because he was standing there. We go out to California. Of course, people try to act like California is different or something. Um, I did my postdoc at Berkeley. It's not that different. And But D.L. Hughley, um, who is a you know famous comedian and, and talk show host, had his house, uh, purchased his house for 500000 and uh, had it fixed it up, had it appraised. The bank flagged it. They were like, this can't be right. Came back, second appraisal, $160,000 higher. He sold it for $770,000, $270,000 more than he purchased it for. Now, why is this important? This is important because uh, local property taxes are linked to education. See, what happened after No Child Left Behind, as you all know, uh, former President George W. Bush issue, No Child Left Behind, everyone was pretty much on board with this. And that's important to note. It's not like this is a Republican or Democrat thing. It's kind of similar to the 1994 crime bill. Everyone was on board with it. And Democrats actually led the charge, Joe Biden in particular, um, and local black mayors. So it's important to know that people were on board with some of these things that went awry and had indirect effects in policy. But what happened is that property taxes really started to drive education funding, not state aid, not federal aid. So part of what that meant is that your property values then drove and still does drives what goes to education. And as my colleague Andre Perry has shown, on average, um, controlling for a host of factors that we would think about safety and education quality and those sort of things, that homes in black neighborhoods with similar amenities are worth $48,000 less, nearly $50,000 less per home amounting to $156 billion in cumulative losses, worth nearly a quarter percent, 25% less than predominantly white homes. This leads to a huge gap in per people spending. 
and $23 billion less than non-white school districts receive in education. This is the legacy of how we think about all the connections that we're talking about here. So accordingly, what would reparations look like? Well, a federal reparations package should think about individual and collective public benefits that simultaneously build wealth and eliminate debt among black citizens, similar to the Harriet Tubman Community Investment Act that is being advanced in the state of Maryland. Now, but still, reparations are all for not without enforcement of anti-discrimination policies that remove barriers to economic mobility and wealth building. That becomes very, very important. And that's part of me highlighting these things is that progress is made, but progress can also be reversed. And in a lot of ways, rarely do we talk about the reversal of the progress that, that's made. What are some of the main forms of reparations people have talked about? Well, um, Andre Perry and I lay out and others have done this as well. Sandy Darity's and uh, Kristen, Kirsten Mueller's book is probably one of the best on the topic as well, in addition to our report, where we say, look, individual payments are important to think about, most definitely. I mean, other groups have received individual payments. We should think about that the same way. But we can also think about a 21st century New Deal for black Americans. That inc includes college tuition, four-year, two-year colleges, also uh, student loan forgiveness for descendants of enslaved black people, uh, black people who attend school, one of the biggest reasons why that debt gap exists between black and white college graduates has to do with student loans. While a lot of white college graduates are receiving some form of funding from their parents, oftentimes equity in their houses, black families don't have that. We could also think about down payment grants and housing, revitaliz ri housing revitalization grants for descendants of enslaved black Americans. This is similar to what uh, Evanston is doing. Now, Evanston has a unique approach where they're taking a small percentage of cannabis tax sales and what they're doing is they set up a fund to give uh, individuals whose family members or either them were discriminated against in housing $25,000 grants. Uh, we helped provide some guidance there where we were saying, look, it shouldn't solely be about new purchases. It should also be about housing revitalization which a lot of people have been able to do that to boost their property values. So there is a president there. And then we can also think about business grants for uh, small businesses and business expansion to hire more employees or purchase property for descendants of enslaved black Americans. This is important because businesses not only make a lot of money through the sales of their products, they also make money through their property. I mean, you could just look at McDonald's or Apple, for example, and, and you can see those examples. And so part of thinking about that is these businesses play a big role because black small businesses, along with women small businesses and Latino small businesses, are some of the fastest growing businesses in the country, particularly among black women. So this investment in more employees becomes very, very important. As I mentioned some different types of programs, I mentioned Evanston in Virginia, the state legislature voted for some of its state universities to atone for slavery or reparations. That includes uh, doing an assessment and actually looking at this and saying, OK, how do we atone for the, the, the black people who helped to build our universities? I think it'll probably be in line with what Georgetown has done, what Princeton Theological Seminary has done, where they are offering scholarships for those descendants of enslaved black people who were uh, who were doing uh, freed and slave labor at that particular time. Of course, we know the state of California has made a series of advancements of late. Um, I was playing a role in that process in terms of helping to expand how we think about it. And uh, Dr. Shirley Weber has done an excellent job as secretary of the state of California doing that particular work. Um, I talked about this as well with Georgetown where students actually voted uh, there were 272 people that were sold in 1838. That created Georgetown's endowment. That's the reason why Georgetown is Georgetown. And then we know even as of uh, earlier this week or last week, uh, a report came out showing that Harvard has been housing indigenous people's uh, bodies as well as some enslaved people's bodies. And now, of course, in addition to their report that they've been doing, they are also on the hook for thinking about reparations. One of the last couple that I'll mention is a, a story of Bruce's Beach in California which some of you all might have heard about this. It was a, a black owned beach because there weren't any beaches that black people could have. Um, this family purchased it. And part of what happened is that then it was taken away from the Bruce's family. And all this time has been land that uh, people have been making money on instead of the Bruce's family. And that money was recently returned. They made a deal 
uh, for how much it was worth and how much money that the Bruce family would be compensated for that. Uh, I also want to talk about who would qualify. What a lot of people say is black people who can trace their heritage to people enslaved in the United States and territories should be eligible. Uh, black people who can show how they were excluded from various policies after emancipation should seek separate damages. This is in line. The second point is in line with what Evanston has done. The, the specific issue is about housing discrimination, not enslavement. But if we're talking about enslavement, then we have to have ways to track that. And I think we do because slave owners actually kept really, really good records because we know that they got certain tax benefits and bank credits for having enslaved people. How would it be paid? Well, one of the things that I highlight is one of the ways to think about it is that we think about federal land. At present, 25 percent of land in the United States is federally owned. Now, of course, we have to be careful and think about what happens with indigenous people and the land that was already theirs. But accordingly, land that is owned federally could be leased. It doesn't have to be sold. It could be leased. Um, you could take out an equity line of credit on it. All the things we know that can be done with land where all of a sudden uh, taxpayers money doesn't have to be hit uh, as much as this. But of course, we know the federal government has it. All we have to do is look at the COVID bailouts and see how that how that shaked out. So I'll stop here and uh, look forward to any questions you all might have. Uh, that was a, a wonderful presentation and, and really eye opening, um, you know, tour through U.S. history. Um, you know, I've learned things that I that I didn't know. Are there any questions either in the room here or online for Dr. Ray? I can ask a question. Okay. Um, Judge Will. I'm sorry. You have to press the, the green button. Okay. Thank you. Um, so my question is, with some of the, the things that you recommend to put in place reparations and some of the structural changes to institutional racism, do you have any idea or do you have an estimate about how long you think if we were to do the things that you recommend, um, how long it may take to structurally change some of these institutions that have had institutional racism for so many years? That's an amazing question. An amazing question, actually. I think the way that scholars have thought about it is maybe less about the length of time it would take for it to correct and more about is there a compensation amount that could be agreed upon that could then be allocated. So in other words, if we use, um, say, the Holocaust as an example, um, or we could even use other incidents such as uh, environmental issues where an entire community has been poisoned due to something a factory has done or something along those lines. There is an equation that's used to kind of think, okay, what becomes a fair form of compensation? Like for Japanese Americans who were interned, um, I mean, the amount of money that was received was nowhere near probably what they should have received, but that was the agreed upon amount. So I think that's that's one part of it, that there's going to be this negotiation that happens to say, OK, what does that look like? And in some ways, they might look like one offs. So they might say, OK, we want to focus on education inequality, like universities might say that. OK, well, they might say, OK, the, the way that we compensate individuals is that um, if a descendant comes to our our university, then they won't have to pay tuition. Now, is that entire amount of money? Is it going to make up the wealth gap? Is it going to compensate this person for the enslavement of their ancestors? No, but that would be the agreed upon um, amount there. So I think it depends on the specific institution. Um, similarly, in Evanston, that $25,000 not, is not nearly enough. It's a start, not a finish. Um, but the other part of the equation, and of course, this is where you all come in as judges, is on one hand, it's about what the compensation is. On the other hand, it's ensuring that we have equitable policies so that things don't reverse, right? Because that, that's the pattern, one of the patterns I was really trying to highlight is that this progress is made, we push up this mountain, and everyone's like, yes, yes, finally we can get over this. And then we look up and two decades later, we're still there because we didn't notice the erosion of the policies that were actually taking place. So sorry that I don't have like a direct answer. I know you were like thinking how many years would it take? But you know, I think that it's more about 
um, thinking about what what a, a, a compensation package would look like that's in alignment with what we've seen previously. Thank you. There's a question in the chat uh, about are there any reparations bills pending in Congress that uh, we could support? Yeah, I think so. I think so, yeah. Judge. So I think it's two of them that um, and I've I've been working with both both of them. So one is uh, H.R. 40. That is the classic reparations bill. It was presented originally in 1989 by Representative John Conyers. That was after um, the the signage of the reparations package for Japanese Americans, which happened in 1988. So this chronology is important because black people were like, okay, Asian Americans got compensation for World War II. Surely next on the docket will be addressing enslavement. Here we are nearly four decades later, later that hasn't happened. So H.R. 40, which is currently being ran by Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee out of Texas, um, they in the House, I actually think in I actually think that they have enough votes in the House to pass. Um, the question, of course, is the Senate. So, you know, I tend to think that the Senate, of course, is the big is the big roadblock, not necessarily the House, at least the way it's currently constructed. We'll see what happens uh, with the midterms. And then the other legislation in the House is a uh, truth and reconciliation bill. Now, the numbers changed a little bit, but it's truth and reconciliation. And uh, Congresswoman Barbara Lee in California is leading that up. So both Congresswomen's last name, Lee, uh, you can look the, look those up. But Barbara Lee has been heading up tr a truth and reconciliation legislation, and it also has a lot of momentum. So both of those, I would say, are legislations um, that I think are in alignment with what we've been discussing here today. Any other questions for Dr. Ray? I've been following the um, the black farmer case in Texas that um, it has been challenging the payments to black farmers under the um, uh, federal legislation. And uh, I'm wondering if you think of that as a reparations case and, and the kind of legal framework around that that you think is of interest to this discussion. Yeah, great question about black farmers. Yes, I do think that the black farmer discussion and legislation can be thought about as reparations. We know that historically and currently, black farmers have been discriminated against and marginalized. And part of that legislation is to correct for that, um, a form of restorative justice, if you will. Well, the unfortunate reality is that this passed and there were, you know, part of it was an executive order. And then all of a sudden it's been stalling in, in the states. And this is another example of where if people just saw the headline, they were like, oh, yeah, black farmers are going to finally get, you know, their fair shake here. And you're not continuing to follow it like you are. Well, you don't know that it's stalling and they really still haven't received what they were supposed to receive. And I think that is something to really start thinking through at the state level is how to better ensure certain types of safeguards that come in from the federal level. Um, but I mean, some of some of the states, particularly in the south. Alabama, South Carolina, Texas, obviously, um, I mean, have just been very, very restrictive at this. And, and you know, I, I think speaking um, from the side of what, say, some Republicans might say, they might say, oh, well, our job is to, you know, be more conservative and protect the interest of our of our residents, whereas Democrats might say, oh, well, no, it's our ability to ensure that things are fair and equitable and restorative. But in a state like Texas, um, it's going to really take Texans to uh, to come out and vote and deal with gerrymandering in the state of Texas. Because I don't know if you all know, under the Obama um, administration, after Obama was elected the first time and particularly the second time, um, there were over 400 polling places closed in Texas. Most of those polling places closed were in predominantly Latino and black neighborhoods. Um, that's not by accident. That is partly they were able to do that because the 1965 Voting Rights Act has to be periodically renewed and the Shelby versus Holder decision in the uh, in the late uh, 2010s, I guess around 20, 2012, 2013, um, allowed for states 
to make changes to, uh, to, to their districts, to their voting districts without having federal oversight. And so, you know, this is my way of saying you get this fallout and you get this great legislation coming from the federal level and why nothing has happened at the state level. And, um, you know, obviously that's something that, that Texas is, is trying to deal with. Any other questions? Well, Dr. Ray, thank you for that compelling uh, presentation. You've given us all a lot to think about, and I think a good framework to respond in discussions involving reparations. So uh, thank you again for coming uh, and, f and fitting us into, I know, what is a very busy schedule. Thank you. Thank you all so much for having me. Uh, I really appreciate the, uh, the patience, particularly of the staff. Uh, you, you all are great. So thank you for, uh, for definitely following up. And in any way that I can be of service in the future, please let me know. I hope you all have a great day. Uh, Dr. Ray, I, have, I actually have one more question. Oh, yeah. Um, would, you, would you be willing to share that PowerPoint? Uh, it was so packed with information. I think we would be able to benefit by just reviewing it at our, at our leisure, too. Sure. Yeah, I'll send it to Kara for sure. Okay. Thanks so much. Okay, thank great you all. Seeing you. Have a great day. Okay, bye-bye. Thank you. Bye.